facts are. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. And in Joplin, Missouri, the death toll has climbed from Sunday's tornado. A massive wall of water that rose as high as 30 feet, swallowing up parts of Japan. The Mississippi River crests just shy of historic proportions. The Libyan warplanes bombing rebel positions. Six war Americans killed in Afghanistan. Violence. Destruction. Devastation. Mass chaos. We all know someday there's going to be Judgment Day. Someday. The entire world is watching. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Word of the Lord. Jim's over here with you, and uh, we certainly appreciate you staying tuned to watch a Word of the Lord. Ask what does the Bible say? You get a Word of the Lord, and here we are, brought to you by the Church of Christ. Uh, the Church of Christ in Eden meets at two of the Boulevard, and you're welcome to visit with us. We had a good Bible study tonight, had some visitors from the community, and uh, certainly welcome uh, them and uh, welcome them back anytime they would like to visit with us. We'd be glad to have them. And uh, if you would like to contact me, 276 340 2653 is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is uh, how you can reach me if you'd like a copy of. Uh, of this program or you'd like a copy of uh, any of the programs we do they're free of charge just simply uh, write to us call us uh, I don't know, send a carrier pigeon whatever just let us know that you want something and we'll be glad to get it out to you so uh, but it is free so uh, we try you know we get a lot of requests so please be patient with us we'll try to get them out to you if you're in the uh, uh, <clears throat> Martinsville area 823 Starling Avenue is where the where the Saints meet in Martinsville. Brother Eugene Edwards, you can reach him at 276-806-6922. And uh, if you're in the Danville area, 120 American Legion, uh, Mark and Micah, they were just on before me. There in their area, they'll be glad to have a Bible study with you and come out and visit with you, whatever it takes to answer your Bible question. Be glad to do that. So uh, we want you to be reminded of that. What does the Bible say comes on Sunday nights at 8.30? Uh, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock, then a word from the Lord, and then religious review at 10.30 after the news. I uh, posted on Facebook that it was 10 o'clock, and I apologize for that. So uh, for those of you who are watching, I hope you're watching now, and you'll know that it's 10.30. But you can watch Mark Children in the News. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. But religious review comes up 10.30 after the news, and uh, we hope that you will stay tuned for that. And uh, 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 that goes through midnight. So... Uh, one of the things that we've been dealing with here of late is the uh, Q Clutch Clan. We've had had uh, some discussions with them on uh, the issues of white uh, supremacy or white how white the white race is God's chosen people. They say, and uh, the last few times we've been on, on uh, television, we've done our lessons that dealt with some of their doctrines or some of their teachings. And you might be saying, oh, no, more on the KKK. Why would you want to do more on the KKK? Well, here's the principle, friends and brethren. In 2 Kings chapter 13, 2 Kings chapter 13, the Bible says, uh, verse 14, Chapter 13, verse 14, 2 Kings. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness wherever he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So Joash knew Elisha was going to die. He was, he was sick unto death. And then the Bible says he later would die of this. And so he says, The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, which is what uh, happened to Elijah when Elijah was carried up. The chariot of Israel came. So Elisha said unto him, verse 15, uh, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said unto the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. 
And he said, open the window. Open the window eastward. And, uh, and he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And he said, now verse 18, and he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice, and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him, and said, thou should have smitten five or six times, then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hast consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Now, here's the principle that I want you to see. When God delivers when God's deliverance is going to deliver an enemy into your hands, you, uh, you do all you can to finish off the enemy. Now, the enemy that we're facing is false doctrine. We're not in a physical warfare. We're not, we're not looking for uh, a rumble on the streets with anybody, but what we are looking for is we're looking for the truth to do battle with false doctrine, and that's exactly what the uh, Eli James, who is with the Christian Identity Movement, and representing the KKK, that's what he was espousing. And so we are going to answer that. We're going to smite, not three times, but five or six times till we consume it. We want to diminish that doctrine that they teach that espouses that the white race is the only chosen race of God and they're the only ones that get the covenants of promise and that they are the only ones that, that are pleasing in God's sight and all the other races are, are incidental or marginalized. We want to diminish that, that, that mindset. And so that is why we're not going to just uh, have the debate one time and then let it go. We want to keep bringing you five or six times the, the doctrines that they teach so that we can diminish them, so you can know of a certainty that what they're teaching is not from the Bible, that it's contrary to what the Bible says. And so that is why we're doing this. That's why we don't just have debates with someone and then say, all right, now we're going and do it by our merry way. We, if you'll notice, we have debates with, with individuals. We continue to take up the debate. We continue to answer them. Now, if they want to come back, they're welcome to it. But most of the time, they have enough the first time, and so we have to answer without them. Like in the case with Dan Parker, however, he came back several nights, all right? And so now, then his doctrine was severely diminished to the point that he bought airtime and it still didn't help his case. So what we're, we're showing you, friends, is the truth is powerful and we're not going to just shoot one arrow out the window and then hit on the ground three times. We're going to, to consume. We want the doctrine of the truth to consume false doctrine. And so that's why we're doing this. Now, here's some more on the KKK. Now, I want to, to make this observation. I want you to listen to this. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because I want to show you the inconsistencies. Anytime you have false doctrine, there will always be inconsistencies in it. For example, like this. The KKK, according to Mr. Eli James, is opposed to the Catholics. They're opposed to Catholics. I want to let you hear it from, from uh, uh, his mouth. Let, let, uh, let him speak for himself on this matter. Here he is. They have, have always had a distaste for Jews, also for Catholics. And the reason for disliking Catholicism is because the Catholic Church has also practiced universalism and race mixing. And those people who understand what the Catholic Church has been up to from the beginning is that the Catholic Church has been using religion to establish a worldwide empire. All right, so here he is. We're, we're opposed to Catholics. They, they promote universalism, uh, race mixing, and so forth. So we're opposed to the KKK or to the to Catholics. Okay, now what I want to know is if you're opposed to the KKK, I mean to the Catholics, if you're opposed, why is it then that you would teach and you would practice and you would look like the people that you're opposed to? For example, let's consider this. The KKK, while they are opposed to Catholics, they're opposed to the Catholics, but they will use the Apocrypha, which is the, the predominant uh, group that used the Apocrypha and says it is scripture, is the Catholics. It's basically the Catholic Bible. 
Now, they're going to say, well, it's in the 1611 King James Bible. I don't care. I have a concordance in my book. That doesn't mean that it's inspired just because somebody put it in there. I have a dictionary in the back. That doesn't mean that it's inspired. That just means somebody put it there. I have maps in the back of mine. That doesn't mean it's inspired. That just means somebody put it there. And so while they are opposed to the Catholics, they tout as a support for their case and their position a book that is filled with Catholic doctrine. Now, here is Mr. James. Listen to what he says. I want you to hear him say he uses the Apocrypha. Now, you're not going to get this information from mainstream Judeo-Christianity, and you're not going to get this information from the Jews because they don't want you to know that you, the Caucasian people, are in fact the true Israelites of the Bible. So they're not going to discuss this history. But this history is clearly in the Old Testament. Much of it is backed up in the New Testament. And also from the apocryphal writings, it will also be backed up from the apocrypha. And of course, from mainstream uh, historical sources. All right, so apocryphal writings. That's what he's going to use. That's his his proof, his background for the position he says. Now, here's what I find very interesting. You're opposed to Catholic doctrine. You're opposed to Catholics, but yet you use a book that the Catholics accept. But watch this. The Catholics did not even accept the Apocrypha until 1563, the, the Council of Trent. So they're using a book that the Catholics didn't even recognize as inspired, but now they do. So, the, you know, actually they're going even further than the Catholics, I guess. They're using a book that the Catholics rejected until 1560, uh, 1563. Now, what I want you to see is this book, the reason why it's accepted by the Catholics is because it's filled with Catholic doctrine. So it makes me wonder, why would you be opposed to the Catholics who really are using the same book that you use? The Catholics get the doctrine that they teach out of the same book that you use, and yet you're going to keep them out of the, of the organization? Notice this. Let me show you some, some inconsistencies, some contradictions with the Apocrypha. Now, this is from the book 2 Maccabees. And I think on one of the calls uh, shows previously, a caller, maybe Mr. James called in and was quoting from the book of Maccabees. Look at this. Consider this. This is from 2 Maccabees. Uh, I'll have the, the scripture here in a minute. Let's see. We're in uh, 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. He says, He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver. He sent it to, unto Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Now stop right there for a minute. The context is talking about an individual who took up a collection to provide for a sin offering. Sounds a lot like indulgences to me, which is Catholic doctrine. All right? And then notice this. He's doing it for the dead. Look, if he did not expect those who had fallen to rise again, if they weren't going to be resurrected again, it would have been foolish to pray for the dead. But since they are, we're going to pray for the dead. That sounds like, that sounds like purgatory, doesn't it? That sounds like the doctrine of purgatory, and here we find it in the book of Maccabees. Here we find it in the, uh, the apocryphal writings, Catholic doctrine, uh, entrenched and entrenched and entrenched and in uh, interwoven, excuse me, in, in the, uh, uh, the writings of the Apocrypha. And here is the book that Christian Identity, KKK, they're going to use as proof text for their existence. Well, let me tell you this. If I find a book that teaches Catholic doctrine and it's teaching con something contrary to the Bible, I'm not going to get my doctrine from it. I'm going to run as far away from it. I'm not going to use it. I don't have to use it. I don't want to use it. Because I don't then want to have to you know, to uh, defend Catholic doctrine. See, so I'm not going to use the Apocrypha. If it, was, if it was in the Bible, why would it then not agree with the Bible? Why would it teach Catholic doctrine? That's why the Catholics even rejected it. 
for almost a thousand years after the existence of the Catholic Church. So here you have the apocryphal writing talking about uh, making collection for a sin offering, praying for the dead. Oh, and it gets better. It gets better. Notice this. Let's keep on reading. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. In other words, if he was talking about, I'm trying to, you know, get, get a reward uh, for those who died in godliness, then it was a pious thing to do to take up a collection and pray for the dead. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. Friends, that's purgatory all over it. That's Catholic doctrine all over it. Why would you oppose the Catholic Church? Why would you oppose Catholicism who uses a book that teaches their doctrine and you use the same book and then you want to turn around and say, no, we're not going to let you in our clan. You're not going to be in our group because you teach race mixing. Why well, they use the same book. They use the same book. So I guess what happens is religion has trumped race. Well, I, you know, well, I admire that. I admire that. At least you're, you know, you're being very, uh, uh, what, consistent with your teaching. You're actually saying that, that the race is more important than religion. We're not going to let the Catholics in. Okay, well, that's the book of Maccabees. Now, let's look it on. Here's another apocryphal book. Uh, Tobit, chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. It's better to give alms than treasure up gold. For almsgiving delivers from death, and it will purge away every sin. Is that not buying indulgences? That's what the Catholic Church is known for, selling indulgences. Well, you pay enough money, and guess what? Your sins will be gone. Well, that might work pretty good for, for politicians, but it doesn't work for those who are interested in serving God. Pay for your sins. Bind your way out of, out of uh, 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 sin sinfulness. Now that's in the apocrypha, friends. Now everybody can recognize that is Catholic doctrine. And yet, the KKK, Christian identity, they want to use this book and say, well, that's where we get our history. That's where we prove our, our, our doctrine from. Well, the Catholics that you reject, the Catholics you reject, they're going to uh, use it too. So why are you rejecting them? They use the same book. They use the same book. Let's go on. Let's look at another one. Let me show you another one. Now, notice the inconsistencies. Remember I told you, friends, if it's contrary to the Bible, I don't want any part of it. So you have the KKK, the Christian identity crowd. What they're doing is they're using a book that the Catholics finally endorsed because it has Catholic doctrine all in it, but they're saying to the Catholics, no, stay away. But look how this book contradicts the Bible. Look how this book contradicts the Bible. This is from Baruch, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, Baruch was the scribe for Jeremiah. All right? These are the words of the book which Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Maaseah, son of Zedekiah, son of uh, Hasadiah, son of Hilkiah, wrote in Babylon. Now notice, Baruch is writing in Babylon in the fifth year on the seventh day of the month at the time when the Chaldeans took Jerusalem and burned it with fire. Now notice, when the Chaldeans took Jerusalem and burned it with fire, the Apocrypha, the Apocryphal book of Baruch says that Baruch was writing in Babylon. All right? He was writing in Babylon. Let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says. Now, this is from Jeremiah chapter 52. In the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came uh, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and all the houses of the great men burned he with fire. That's Jeremiah 52, 12. So here is the account that Jeremiah gives of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, coming in and burning Jerusalem. 
Now guess where Baruch is? Remember, the Apocrypha said that he was in Babylon. Now, Jeremiah 52 says that Babylon, the king of Babylon came, Jerusalem was burned, and guess where Baruch was? According to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 43, verse 6 and 7, Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch the son of Neriah, so they came into the land of Egypt. Now, this is some time before the king of Babylon ever came and burnt Jerusalem and burnt the house of Jerusalem. So how is it that he was in Babylon, according to the Apocrypha, and in Egypt at the same time Jerusalem was being burned? See, the books do not agree. The books do not agree. The book of Baruch does not agree with the book of Jeremiah. I tell you what, I'm going to take the book of Jeremiah. I'll take the Bible over Baruch. I'll take the Bible over the Apocrypha, but remember what we said even in the debate. If your doctrine's not in the Bible, you've got to find it somewhere else. So what does the Christian identity crowd do? They say, well, we're going to use the Apocrypha because we just can't get all of our doctrine out of the Bible. That's right because it's not from God. So we have to have something else. We have to borrow from the Catholics. We have to borrow the Catholic book to get a, a doctrine, and then we're going to turn around and say to the Catholics, you're not welcome to our clan. Well, you know, inconsistency. That's what you have. So, you know, the clan is borrowing from the Catholics in order to get their doctrine. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's not the only thing they borrowed from the Catholics. You may say, well, James, that's a far stretch to say they borrowed from the Catholic. Well, they're using the Catholic book, the Apocrypha. But let's talk about this. If I was to show you this picture, you tell me what you think. Do you know the, the Q Klux Klan is opposed to the Catholics but look, they dress in Catholic-styled robes. Can you see this? These guys got the pointed hats, full face cover, purple robes. And you say, well, James, that's, that's a stretch. Well, look at this. Look at this. I'm going to show you some more pictures. If I was to show you these pictures, you might say, well, that's, that's a, some clan gathering. What this is, friends, this is Catholicism. All right, this is a branch of Catholicism. Look at this. A common feature in Spain is the almost general usage of the Nazareno or penitential robe for some of the participants in the processions. This garment consists of a tunic, a hood, with a uh, conical tip, which is called uh, uh, caparotti, used to conceal the face and, uh, of the wearer and sometimes a cloak. Well, I tell you what, when you talk about the, the KKK, one of the things that everybody always associates is the, the long robes and the, and the pointed hats and the covered faces. Well, where'd they get that? Where'd they borrow it from? I said they borrowed it from the Catholics. They borrowed it from the Catholics, the people that they won't let in the Klan. Now, notice this. The exact colors and forms of these robes depend on the particular procession. Now, think about this. If you watch footage from even the, 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 uh, the KKK rally in Stewart, you saw all different kinds, different colors of robes, did you not? Saw black ones, saw white ones, saw some purple ones. Now, what do they mean? They mean that they're different uh, branches, different things. It's over my bag. All right? Now, they're, they're standing for something. Where'd they get it? I'm just saying it's kind of a coincidence. It's kind of a coincidence for, that, they're, that, they're, that they resemble so much, okay? Now, let's, let's look on. Let's look on here. The robes were widely used in a medieval, uh, medieval period for penitents who could demonstrate their penance while still masking their identity. All right? Again, I'm just showing you that in the Catholic procession, the Catholic procession, you have, uh, you have a whole lot of folks that are, that are, are looking 
like the folks that uh, we've just had discussions with in the KKK. You got the face mask, the, fa the robes, long robes, part of Catholic doctrine, part of Catholic doctrine. Look at this. Uh, the Nazarenos carry processional candles or rough-hewn wooden crosses as they walk through the streets barefoot and in some places they may carry shackles and chains on their feet on their, on their feet as penitents. Well, you know what? If you saw this picture right here, this, this one that's in black and white, you might think that was 1940s or 1950s in southern Alabama. But that's not. That's not. That's a Catholic march. Those are, those are, those are, uh, these are all Catholics right here carrying their crosses and wearing their robes and their, and their hoods. I'm saying, friends, it's really no stretch that the KKK would borrow something that looks so much like the Catholics because they've already borrowed their book. Why don't they borrow the robes too? You know why they do it, friends? Because they try, they're, they're just doing something that's not in the Bible. See? So when you go outside the Word, when you go beyond the Word, anything goes. Anything goes, all right? Now, so... So if I was to put this up, which one's the Klan and which one's the Catholics? Now, you probably recognize, well, these, these guys are, are the Klan right here. And these are the Catholics. But, but you know what? Boy, they sure look close. They may not be brethren. They might not be in the Klan. But they sure are cousins. Because they use the same book. They use the same robes. Same style robes. It's amazing that, that the Klan has historically been anti-Catholic. But guess what? Guess what? When David Duke was the head wizard, grand wizard, national director of the KKK, he actually encouraged Catholics to join the Klan. Now I find that very interesting. All this time they've been opposed to the Catholics, because I guess because most of the immigrants were uh, Catholics and they were opposed to immigration. But think about this. What happens, what happens when your message is so weak that it doesn't carry its own weight and membership starts declining? You've got to have folks come in. It's the same thing Joel Osteen and them guys, those guys do. If we're going to get the people to come in, we've got to change the message. We've got to allow more people in. Guess what happens? Guess what happens? We've opposed Catholics. We've opposed Catholics. But, you know, now as we come on down through time, it sure would boost uh, membership if we could just let people come in who are Catholics. Of course, you had to be white, but as long as you're Catholic, if you're Catholic, as long as you're white, you're okay. Let's welcome them in. Well, it's about time. You borrowed the book, you borrowed the robes, you might as well call them brethren. See? Bring them on in. Bring them on in. You've borrowed everything else from them. Now, I just want to say this. You may, be, you may be saying, well, you know, this is all fun. And we're all laughing at the fact that, yeah, they dress alike, they use the same uh, unscriptural book to get their doctrine, and then they turn around and decide, well, you know what, maybe race is more important than religion. And so we will say, you know what, We'll just, uh, we'll just let you in. Now, friends, you may say, you may be looking at it and saying, yeah, they borrowed a lot from the Catholics. But you know what? The Ku Klux Catholics, Ku Klux Catholics, they're not the only ones who borrow things from the Catholics. I want to show you in the remainder of our time, you do the same thing. You borrow things from the Catholics too. You may be looking at the at the uh, Ku Klux Catholics and saying, "Yeah, they borrowed a lot from the Catholics," but you did too, friends. You borrowed from the Catholics. You don't believe me? Watch this. Watch this. If you are in a church, in a religious group, and y'all use mechanical instruments of music in worship, you borrowed from the Catholics. Because you didn't get it from the Bible, so you had to go somewhere else. And the Catholic Church is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, religion outside of the New Testament. 16, in the in 1600s when they started. Now look at this. 
you, you used mechanical instruments to use it. You had to get it somewhere because you didn't get it from the Bible. Look at this. In Ephesians 5, verse 19, I want you to notice. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. <clears throat> Here's what Paul says. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The apostle Paul said, speak. He didn't say anything about play. He didn't say anything about a guitar or a piano. He didn't say anything about the band. He said, speak to yourselves in psalm, singing, make melody in your heart to the Lord. Some of them said, well, that word solo means to pluck the string. Okay, fine. Tell me what instrument you're plucking. What instrument does God say that you're going to pluck? Here's the instrument right here. It's the heart. The heart is what God says. If you're going to make melody, it's going to be in your heart. Not the harp, but the heart. See, in the first century church, they didn't have mechanical instruments of music. You borrowed that from somewhere. You didn't borrow it from the Bible. You had to go to another book. And you had to get it from another tradition. So I say you borrowed it from the Catholics. You didn't borrow it from the Bible. Certainly didn't borrow it from the Bible. You, you had to borrow it from, uh, uh, from somebody else. Notice in Colossians 3 and verse 16. Here we have. <clears throat> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. There's no playing there. There's no playing there. This is offering up teaching. It's offering up singing in grace to the Lord. Now, friends, you just, you just can't get mechanical instrument music out of that. You had to borrow them somewhere. See, now you're not laughing. See, you, you might have been laughing earlier about how people borrowed something from the Catholics, but you do the same thing. You borrowed from an apostate group. You borrowed from an unscriptural practice, and that's what you use in your worship. Oh, you may have a piano. Someone else may have a whole band over here, and you're both wrong. And some of you who have a piano would be opposed to having the, the hip-hop music. So what? You all invited it in. You just borrowed it from the Catholics. That's all you did. You borrowed it from the Catholics. Here's what God wants, oh friends. God wants, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, God wants the fruit of your lips. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The fruit of your lips, that don't mean tooting on your horn either. That means singing. That's giving thanks. See? That's praise. Now you borrowed something from the Catholics if you got any kind of mechanical instrument of music in your worship. You borrowed it from the Catholics. You borrowed it from the Catholics. You don't think you did? Just check and see. The first century church, the first century church did not have it in their worship. All right? Now, what about this? If you have a choir, if you have a choir in your worship, you borrowed something from the Catholics. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, you did. The first century church didn't, didn't use choirs. The first century church didn't look out there and say, well, little Timmy, you can't sing very well, so you need to sit out there in the pew. And we're going to have all these other people who, who got pretty voices stand up here in front of us and sing to us. Let me tell you, in the first century church, they didn't have a choir. Everybody was singing. Everybody was singing. We already read Ephesians 5.19. Colossians 3.16. It says speaking, right, and teaching one another. Speaking to yourselves. Now, friends, that is 
a reciprocal action. That means I'm singing to you and you're singing to me. And when there's a choir up there, they're singing one way. It's not coming back. See? You got the band up there playing, blowing smoke, and you got the lead singer up there. He's jamming in his little rock concert to the Lord. No. That's entertainment, what that is. You're not being taught. You're not being taught. Choirs are, are contrary to what the Bible says. Where'd you get it? You had to get it from the Catholics. You had to get it from somewhere else. You had to have another book. You had to have another tradition, another practice come in in order to change what God said. And I'll just tell you this. We've got some folks in the Lord's church who think that, well, we don't have a piano, we don't have mechanical instruments of music, but we can go up here and we can make all kinds of sounds with our voice. Uh-uh. That's not speaking. That's not singing. That's not teaching and, and admonishing. Notice this, in Colossians 3, in verse 16, here's what Paul says, teaching and admonishing one another. Now, how are you going to be taught when someone's up there going, hmm, so that's not teaching anybody. The beatbox noises with your voice, that's not teaching anybody. How are you admonishing someone? How are you exhorting someone? How are you teaching them? You just can't do it. Let the word dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing. See, friend, you had to borrow something from somebody else. You didn't get it from the Bible. You borrowed it from the Catholics. Now, in this way, you're not much different than Christian identity or the KKK. See? You're just like the Ku Klux Catholics, born from, the, born from the Catholics, born from the Pope. See? That's what we're talking about. Now, look at this. He said, well, I'm not, I haven't borrowed anything from the Catholics. Oh, yes, you did. What about this one-man rule stuff? You know you've got a pastor you got a pastor, one man rule. He's, he's over everything. You borrowed it from the Catholics. That's where it all started. The idea that one man's going to have the power and he's going to dictate what everybody else does. There's the hierarchy. Start to develop. One man is going to start dictating all the way down the line who's going to do what and who's going to say what. You borrowed from, you borrowed from your, your daddy, the, the Pope. You borrowed from the Catholics. Next thing you know, you're going to be wearing a little robe like they do too. And you're going to be wearing a little pointed hat like they do. You might as well. You borrowed it from them. You borrowed everything else from them. You borrowed your doctrine from it. But the first century church didn't practice one-man rule. In Philippians 1, verse 1, look at this. Philippians 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Paul and, Tim and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops. With the bishops and deacons. Notice the S, the plural here. Here's the plural. Bishops and deacons. It's always plural. The only time it's singular is when Paul is telling the qualifications for a bishop. But even then, if he's going to be a bishop in the Lord's church, he's going to have to have someone else to be a bishop with him, and thus you have bishops, and these are the same persons as elders. There's always more than one. Always the plurality. Always the plurality. Notice Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Here's what Paul says. He says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful unruly children, for a, look at this, verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless. He says, I want you to ordain, eld, uh, ordain elders in every city, and then he gives a qualification for a bishop. Now, why would he do that? Because of the same thing. They're referring to the same person, the same office. Now, you got one man rule, you got one pastor, you borrowed it from the Pope. You borrowed it from the Catholics. You didn't get it from the Bible. You get it from the New Testament. 
You want me to show you that, that bishops and elders are all the same? Look at this in Acts 20. Sorry about that. In Acts chapter 20 in verse 7. Sorry, 17. Acts 20, verse 17. From Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. There's the elders. The elders of the church. And he says to them, he starts talking to them in verse 18. All right? Now this is what he says to them. When you come down and you get to verse 28, Here's what Paul says to the elders. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, elders, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's the same word as bishop. Same word. It's the same word as bishop. In, in 1 Timothy 1, or excuse me, 1 Timothy 3, 1, Titus 1, 7, same word as bishop. And he says to the elders, the Holy Ghost has made you bishops to feed the church of God. Feed is the word for pastor. It's the same word, same word, uh, form of the word. Anyway, this is the, the verb. The noun is in Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 where Paul says, he gave some to be pastors. A pastor is someone who feeds. So look at what Paul says. Look at what Paul says in Acts 20. In verse 28, he says to the elders, Take heed therefore to yourselves, elders, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you bishops to be pastors over the church of God. Elders, bishops, overseers, pastors, they're all the same. And there's always more than one. Now, where did you get this idea of one man rule? One man who has a hierarchy. And by the way, the KKK used to have a one man rule. One man is a hierarchy. I don't know if they've if they, uh, gotten away from that or not, but the national director... You know, David Duke and those guys, they were, they were the, uh, the top dog. They were the top guy, the, same, the Pope, if you will. They're the one giving orders to, the, to Nash, all the national clan. Where'd you get it from? Same place the Baptists got their one pastor from. Got it from the Catholics. See, it's, not a, it's not a biblical organization. You can say, well, the, the KKK is a Christian organization. Oh, no, it's not. It's not organized like one. doesn't practice like one. It's just like the Baptist, which that may be why some of the Baptists are so comfortable at the KKK. I don't know. See? You see what we're talking about? You get, you get your design, you get your doctrine, you get it from the, from the Catholics. You just like them. You've been barred something from the Catholics. You don't, believe, you don't believe that you teach that the... That the, uh, the uh, pastor has all authority. Look at this. This is from the Hiscox Baptist Manual. The pastor has the oversight and supervision of all the interests of the church and of all departments of its work, both spiritual and temporal. He's over it all. He is over it all. Now look at this. The pastor should be concerned for the religious nurture of children and youth, but not neglect the, uh, 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 the others. The last sentence here. He is equally the shepherd of all his flock. The shepherd of all his flock. It's not the Lord's flock. It's his, all right, and he is the only shepherd. Friends, you borrowed it from the Catholics. You didn't get it from the book. Scotty, go ahead and put the phone numbers up. We lost track of time. Go ahead and put the phone numbers up if you would, please. See, friends, you borrowed all this from the Catholics. Sure did. You borrowed it all from the Catholics. You didn't get it from the Bible. 
All right? You want to see another one? Do you believe in infant baptism? Sprinkling? Where'd you get that? You bought it from the Catholics. You bought it from the Catholics. See, don't be laughing at the Ku Klux Catholics. You, you borrowed something from the Catholics too. Infant baptism, you know you did. That's where you got it. You didn't get it from the Bible. The first century church didn't sprinkle water on a baby. They didn't pour water on a baby. What, the, what, you, what you're doing is you got something from the Catholics. Look at this. In, a, in a Acts 5, verse 14. Here we go. And the believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. But no babies and no children. Men and women. Men and women. No babies. No children. Men and women were added to the Lord. Now where do you get the authority? Where do you get the authority to pour some water on a baby's head and say that you've baptized him? Where do you get the authority to do that? You had to get it from the, from the, from the Catholics. You didn't get it from the Bible. You want to work from the Lord? James. Yes, sir. Uh, you keep talking about the elders. Does your church have elders? We don't have men qualified. I don't have a church. Okay. I don't have a church, but we don't have men qualified. You don't have nobody qualified to be an elder? No. And Johnny Roberts makes the title over all three churches. No, he doesn't. Kind of like the Catholics. No, Johnny doesn't have anything. Johnny doesn't have anything to do with what we do in Eden. Well, I mean, so why, what, so where do you, where, why are you making that accusation? Johnny's got everything to do with what you do in Eden. We work together, but word over anybody's word, even the members of the church word. Now, now, why are you making that accusation? Give the proof. Because that's because give the I'm proof. There. I know how it works. Give the proof. Excuse me. I said, give the proof. That's what, that's what I thought. That, that's what I thought. You said no proof, so you're making you're making a false accusation. That's exactly. Well, you that's sat on your you sat on your front porch in your Superman underwear and sat there and told me that Johnny made the call. No, I didn't, Charlie. I did not. Well, you didn't. Know well, you did, Charlie. I didn't. You said let's talk to Johnny, and I said why does Johnny have to have anything to do with it? You the one who wanted to go to talk to Johnny. No, I wasn't the one that wanted to talk to Johnny. You was the one that said Johnny made the call. I didn't. I said Johnny called. And to this very day, you I still said, say that Johnny didn't make the call. I said he called on the phone to talk to the man we're talking about. I didn't say he made the call about what to do. So what Johnny can call the members of your church and stir up a bunch of, bunch of stuff, and you're going to believe Johnny instead no. of the members of the church. No. I'm not going. I'm not going to believe that he did that. I know what happened. Well, you are, uh, Charlie, I, you Charlie I know what happened. I know, why don't you tell people what happened? We're talking about a man who wanted to smoke pot, and we said you can't do it, and he got mad, and you went with him. Now go ahead and say it. No, I didn't go with him. I what? stayed right there with you. You know I did. That day? But what did you do I the next day? And, I Everybody stayed with you day? until you lied, lied to me up there on your front porch. I didn't, I didn't lie to you. Yes, you did. No, Charlie, I did not lie to you. I, I said to you, you hey, said, let's talk to Johnny I'm about it. And I no said, it's because you Charlie, lied to me. Charlie, I did not lie to you. I said, you said, let's call Johnny. See what he wanted about. I said, I don't need to talk to Johnny. Why, does, why do I need to talk to Johnny about something that happened down at our church building in front of, in front of members of the church in Danville, and Martinsville. Why do I need to talk to anybody? It was out there in the open. You told no, me. No, you're a liar. And made the call. No, you're a liar, Charlie. Yeah, and you still calling me a liar. That's uh, exactly I right. I call a liar. I call a good day, James. I call I call a liar what he is. <clears throat> now, my friends, here's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with someone who was involved in the situation. He he had been a member of the church for one day. And now he wants to presume that he knows how to handle the situation that arrives. Not the case. Not the case. He wanted to be the one that, that brought Johnny into it. And I said, no. I don't have to talk to Johnny about it. 
Johnny had talked to the guy because the guy had, had uh, uh, mentioned something. And Johnny asked me, he said, if, would it help if I called the man? I said, if you want to call him, you can. So, but I know what's happened. You know, we've already been to the point with him. So, anyway, but as far as why we don't have elders, we don't have men qualified. But I can assure you if we did have men qualified, they had handled the situation just like, like we did handle it. Now, so anyway, you must have borrowed it from the Catholics. All right, you want to work from the Lord? Hey, James. Yeah. Y'all don't have no elders and deacons in the church? We don't have men qualified to be elders. Well, uh, how do you get qualified to be an elder or deacon? All right, that's a good question. Let, let me answer that question for you. Here's what the Bible says. If a man desires the office of a bishop, now that's an elder, he uh. desires a good work. Here's what he has to be. He must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection, with all gravity. All right, let's, let's come on down. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Verse 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. A lot of the folks in the, in the church where I am are new convert. They, they're, not, they're not skilled. They don't, they're not apt to teach. They, maybe they don't have uh, uh, children. Maybe they don't have children. How are they going to rule their own house and how are they going to have their children's objection when they don't even have children? See? Uh, these are what we're talking about. He must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and, um, and snare the devil. These are, the, a lot of these qualifications are what all Christians have to have. But if you don't have men who have children who are, are believing, who are in subjection, if you don't have men that have children, or you have uh, men that are novices, they are not skilled in teaching. They, they can't uh, uh, convince the gainsayer. Look at this. In Titus chapter 1 and verse, we'll get on down to verse 7. He, here's what he says. Uh, he has to be, verse 9, here's some more. Holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may by a, be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, these are our qualifications of elders. So if you don't have men that are skilled in the word or men who can give an answer or men who can teach or men that have their children in subjection, then they don't, they're not qualified. And so why I put a man in a position that doesn't meet God's qualifications and then turn around and expect that God's going to be pleased with it? See? So it's not, it's not like we don't want them. It's just that we don't have men qualified. You know, we're teaching people the gospel. They're coming out of a lot of these denominations, and uh, they're, just, they're just not qualified. Does that, does that help? Yeah, but I know some uh, uh, deacons, and they, they can, they can uh, preach the word just, just like the pastor can. Well... Yeah, if you deacons and elders, they be, elders, they be teaching the word. But I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say, number one, if they're, if you have elders, and they're teaching just like the pastor, that tells me that you're not in the Lord's church, because in the Lord's church, elders are pastors. Oh, that's what, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from. Well. But I'm saying if you're going if we're gonna do it the way the Bible says, we're gonna have men that are qualified like the Bible says to be qualified. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks for your call. All right, hope that helped. All right. But when we're talking about let's get back to this. About salvation. All right, we've got another call. We'll just go ahead and take it. You on a word from the Lord? Hey James, how you doing? This is Steve Bazin up in Michigan. Hey Steve, I'm doing great. Hey, I just thought it would be a good place to, to emphasize that, you know, that uh, the bishops and the elders, uh, and I don't want to diminish their work. They do, they're worthy of double honor. I understand all that. 
but ultimately our head is Jesus Christ and we're to follow him. And uh, the problem that we're seeing in the denominational world primarily is they're taking the one-man pastor system and holding this one man above the authority of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the primary problem that we've been dealing with. I, I think that's a good point. That's an excellent point. And, 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 uh, another, and another thing, Steve, I'd say this too. Notice what Paul said. To, when Paul said the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. He has to desire to be in charge and to, to look out for all these people's souls. And I would say that uh, especially in the one pastor system, all he's really concerned about is their pocketbooks. He's not worried about their souls. He's more worried about their their savings. Exactly. You and, know? And they, they, they only can rule in matters of option. Uh, when it comes to matters of obligation, the, the Lord must uh, must uh, rule the day. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Just thought I'd, uh, just thought I'd uh, uh, plug that in a little bit there. And uh, thanks a lot, Jim. All right. Thanks, Steve. Good, good talking thanks, to you. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that, that's a good... That's a good uh, call just to end on because we are out of time. But ultimately, it does come down to to what the Bible says. We're going to do what the Bible says. And we're not going to borrow from the Catholics or anybody else. We're simply going to do what thus saith the Lord. And uh, I hope that you realize, friends, you know, if you're doing something that's not in the Bible, you had to get it from somewhere. You didn't get it from the Bible. You had to borrow it from the Catholics. That's probably where you got it from. We're going to, uh, let me see, put my... Uh, content information back up here. I want to thank you for watching. If you'd like to copy this program or any of the things we do, we want you to uh, feel free to contact us. Scotty, can you queue up that tent commercial again? We'll go off with the tent commercial. So uh, remember to ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord, and then you can do your own religious view, and that's going to be coming up at 1030 after the news. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and have a good night. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It's a beautiful day for a neighbor. And in Joplin, Missouri, the death toll has climbed from Sunday's tornado. A massive wall of water that rose as high as 30 feet, swallowing up parts of... It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It's a beautiful day for a neighbor. And in Joplin, Missouri, the death toll has climbed from Sunday's tornado. A massive wall of water that rose as high as 30 feet, swallowing up parts of Japan.